Hi everybody, welcome to the next instalment in our series of video that looks at snowboard design and construction. In the first two episodes we looked at snowboard shapes and profiles and how they affect how the board rides. Then we looked at wood cores. Now in this next section we're going to take a look at the board structural layers. Now if the core of the board is the filling in the sandwich construction, then the structural layers are the bread and butter. Structural layers are generally formed by combining glass fibre strands in a variety of weights and densities with some kind of matrix. This combination creates a rigid layer that adds longitudinal and torsional strength to the board, or to put it more plainly, you make the board stiffer by adding a stiff fiberglass layer. Now what we're going to do is concentrate primarily on talking about fiberglass, as pretty much all boards use fiberglass structural layers. However, on some top end boards, the glass layer is replaced by carbon fibre. But no matter if the structural layers are glass or carbon, the same mechanical properties apply to the material. It's just that the carbon is going to be more powerful and give you a stiffer board. So let's start by looking at glass fibre. Now glass fibre has excellent strength in both tension and compression, but across its axis it's really weak. To overcome this weakness, fibres are orientated in multiple layers to create a sheet matting that prevents the fibres buckling forming a material that is strong in multiple directions. Now for snowboards, these multi-directional fibres are stitched together rather than woven. Now what this means is that you have a layer of fibres running in one direction and then a second or third layer running in alternative directions. These are then stitched together creating a sheet material. Now this manufacturing technique that creates a matting that is less prone to damage during the construction process and this ensures a more consistent performance for the board. Now at this point all we've got is a floppy sheet of glass fibre fabric. To turn that sheet into a rigid structural layer and help bond it to the rest of the board we need to add a matrix. Now the matrix is usually a thermosetting resin that when cured forms into a hard plastic material bonding together with the glass fibres to create a rigid and strong structural layer. Now this bit is probably irrelevant to most people but hey if we're going to go into detail let's go into detail. So on snowboards you've generally got three types of resin that form the structural matrix. These are epoxy, polyurethane and eco resin. These three resins all have different properties so when the designers create the board these properties have to be taken into account. Okay so the first of these resins is epoxy. Now epoxy resins were the traditional resin that pretty much everybody used to use. Epoxy resin cures very hard though, so that has to be taken into account during the design stages because it's going to create a stiffer overall flex. However, the downsides of epoxy are pre pretty significant. The first is that it's really toxic, the second is that it's prone to a chemical reaction that can affect its performance. And that's why over the past few years you've seen almost a wholesale shift towards using polyurethane resins. Now polyurethane resins are less toxic and more stable. They also remain more flexible when cured, allowing the designer to be a lot more accurate when creating the board's flex. Now the final resin is what we're going to call eco resin. Now different brands use different names for these, but in reality they're all pretty similar. Eco resins are a group of polymer resins that are non-toxic and are usually based on a vegetable extracts, i.e. sap. Bioresins are similar to polyurethane resins in that they don't cure as rigid as epoxy, so again, this has to be taken into account when designing the board. Now, the benefits of bioresin are so obvious on both an environmental level and a staff welfare level. So that's why we're beginning to see bioresins becoming far more commonplace in snowboard construction. I suspect it's probably not going to be too long until we see nearly all boards manufactured that way. Okay, so now we know how uh, to manufacturers create the structural layers, let's now look at how they use them to give the board different flex characteristics. So what we're going to look at is how different glass orientation affects performance. Now we could go really technical on this and look into how different glass weights and weave densities affect the performance, but to be totally honest, that's a whole different world of composite engineering and it's well beyond my knowledge base. So what we're gonna do is focus on those different fiber orientations that manufacturers use. Now these are gonna have the same mechanical characteristics no matter the glass weight or density. It's just that the heavy and denser fibers are gonna create a stiffer flex, pretty much the same as what the carbon would do. 
So the first glass we're going to look at is Biax. Now, as you can see from the image, Biax glass features glass running in two directions, at 0 degrees and 90 degrees. These add strength along both the length and the width of the board. However, because the reinforcing is only running across the length and the width, it's not adding much resistance to the torsional twisting. And that's the reason why you see Biax glass used on boards that have a softer or more playful fex. By reducing torsional rigidity, you're going to allow the board to twist, creating a predictable and easier ride. This lets the board absorb terrain undulations, allowing the rider to concentrate on riding rather than worrying about what's going on under their, their feet. Now, create this creates the perfect flex for park riders and urban riders who just need a board that delivers that predictable feel. However, the downside to bias glass comes when you start to put load in it. Because it's not very powerful torsionally, it's really easy to overload the flex as you start to ride faster and harder. So as you start to drive the board, the softer flex just can't hold the energy that you're putting into it. So it reaches a point where it just says no more and then just lets go. Now you'll generally notice this when you're riding faster you'll feel the board starting to wash out in the final third of the turn it's kind of like overwinding the spring at some point the flex is just going to say i can't hold this any longer so to counter that you then step up to a triax glass now if you compare the image you can see that we've got the same glass running at 90 degrees but now we've added two glass layers with the fibers orientated at angles across the width now, by running those additional fibers at opposing angles across that width, we've added resistance to torsional twisting, giving the board a responsive and dynamic ride. This stiffer torsional flex allows the board to hold more energy, creating a stable ride at speed and a more powerful overall feel. Now, one of the great things about Triax glass is that you can also manipulate the torsional flex by altering the angle of those glass strands. So if you're after a super responsive ride, you run those angles at 45 degrees. Now, this is the optimum angle for Triax. If you go over 45 degrees, it loses torsional rigidity. Now, you can also shallow off the angle to around 33 degrees, giving you a slightly softer torsional flex. You'll normally see this in the higher end freestyle boards where you need that combination of performance, but performance with a more predictable feel. Now, as with the 45 degree glass, you wouldn't want to go much below this angle because, again, you're going to lose torsional rigidity. In fact, go much below 30 degrees and you're really just turning it into a Biax glass. So, that's basically the structural layers for a snowboard. Uh, you did used to be able to get uh, a quad axe glass which runs almost identical to the triax, but it just adds um, a strip of glass running at naught degrees as well. Um, there was a few boards that used to use quad axe glass, but the factory that produces those shut down some while ago, so we don't really see it that often. Um, so what we're next going to look at is we're going to look at how manufacturers add extra power to those structural layers by bringing in new materials to just give the board more pop and more power through its uh, width and through its length. So now we know how structural layers work, let's take a look at how designers add an extra level of performance into the board. Now, if we go back to the sandwich construction image, the thing that we're going to take a look at is what we call the reinforcing layers. Now, these layers are used to add increased performance to specific areas of the board, adding additional stringers to the glass structure layers formed from either carbon fibre or basalt fibre. Now, what we're going to do in this section is take a look at the most common reinforcing layouts that manufacturers use and how these affect the board's performance. However, before we can do that, we need to look at the materials that manufacturers use to extract that extra performance. Now, until quite recently, this material was pretty much exclusively carbon fibre. But over the past few years, we've seen more and more boards moving to basalt. So before we look at the specific types of layup, what we're going to do is take a quick look at both basalt and carbon fibre, explain the difference between both materials and why board designers use them. Now the first material we're going to take a look at is carbon fibre. So what exactly is carbon fibre? Well I'm going to try and explain without getting too technical because understanding how carbon fibre is made really helps you understand why it has such high strength. So the starting point for carbon fibre is the raw material which is called the precursor. Now the precursor is usually made from polyacrylonitrile but can sometimes be either rayon or petroleum pitch. 
Now, all of these materials are organic polymers categorized by long strands of molecules bonded together by carbon atoms. This precursor then goes through a process where it's drawn into long, thin fibers. These fibers are then heated to between 2,000 and 3,000 degrees centigrade in a pressurized oxygen-free furnace. This process causes the non-carbon atoms to vibrate and detach themselves from the fiber. The remaining carbon atoms then bond to for together to form a tight crystalline structure that attaches parallel to the long axis of the fiber. Now these fibers are then bundled together to form what we call a toe, i.e. what is traditionally carbon fiber. Now because of that unique atomic bonding process, you get a lightweight material that delivers high stiffness and high tensile strength. So it's the perfect material for snowboard construction. However, the downside of that complex manufacturing process means that carbon fiber is really expensive. Now, because of that prohibitive cost alongside its not exactly environmentally friendly construction process, we've started to see many brands move towards using reinforcing layers formed from basalt fibers. So, what are basalt fibers? Well, basalt is an igneous rock, which means it began in a molten state. You can find basalt in just about every country in the world, so it's really readily available. Now, to turn this rock into a fiber is a relatively straightforward process compared to carbon fiber. First, the quarried basalt rock is crushed into a fine material. This material is then placed into a melting bath, which is heated to around 1500 degrees Celsius in a furnace to turn the rock back into a liquid form. That liquid rock is then extruded through a series of dyes, forming a continuous strand of fiber. There are no additives, no complex pressurized heating. It's just the raw molten rock extruded into that fiber. Now, as with carbon fiber, the single strands are then bundled together to create a usable basalt fiber. These bundled fibers are then laid up in exactly the same way as carbon fiber. Now, when mixed with the matrix during the board's layup, the basalt fibers show an increased strength of around 13.7% over traditional glass fiber. But more importantly, they show an increased stiffness of around 17.5%. Now, although basalt's increased strength and stiffness don't rival those of carbon fibre, it still makes it the perfect material for snowboards because on the majority of boards, you're really only looking for a little bit of stiffness to improve the performance. Using carbon fibre in these circumstances would not only be overkill, but it would also significantly increase the price of the board. Okay, so now we know the properties of the two most common materials, let's look at how you would use them. Now, unlike the main structural layers, carbon and basalt are generally used as a collection of fibers running a single direction, as opposed to a sheet material running multiple fibers in multiple directions. Laying up the reinforcing this way allows the designers to add stiffness and enhanced flex in a very controlled manner. So let's now take a look how the designers use reinforcing in different zones of the board to enhance very specific riding characteristics. Now, the first reinforcing configuration is what we're gonna call a beam. Now, as you can see from the image, the beam runs up through the center of the board. This increases resistance through the length, creating a snappier and more lively flex. The more beams you add, the more power you get. This configuration is gonna give the board more pop, so it's perfect for boards that want a lively feel through the length, but still want to retain a more predictable torsional flex. Now the next reinforcing configuration we're gonna look at is what we're gonna call the X-bracing. Now as you can see from the image, it's pretty obvious as to why it's called X-bracing. X-braces can be added to either the tip or tail of the board individually or to both at the same time. This layout creates stiffness torsion zones at the tip and tail of the board by reinforcing the torsional stiffness in those areas. These present the tips twisting, giving the board a more dynamic response into and out of the turn, whilst allowing the center part of the board to remain a little bit more predictable through the middle of the turn. Now next up, we have what we're gonna call cross bracing. Again, this reinforcing configuration runs in an X format, but this time the string has run from the contact points in the nose to the opposing contact points in the tail. Now, as you can see from the image, this reinforcing runs across the whole width of the board. So what this is gonna do is increase the torsional resistance, giving the board a more stable and reassuring ride. However, it's gonna beef up that torsional flex without having to resort to a lot stiffer overall structural layers and compromising some of the more rider-friendly characteristics of those more easy-going performance boards. 
Now we've now moved to configuration number four. As you can see from the image, this is a variation of the beam layout. However, instead of running a single beam through the center of the board, this configuration runs a beam either side of the insert pipe. These beams can again be formed from single stringers through to multiple and wide format stringers, depending on how much power you want to add. Now the advantage of running this format is that not only does it increase the pop through the length of the board, it also adds power closer to the side cut. The closer you move the beams to the edge of the board, the more power you get. This gives a more powerful and stable ride through the turn and is particularly suited to faster riders who need the security of increased edge hold. Now this next configuration we're gonna call forks. Forks generally run from under the insert pack either out to the contact points or through to the tail of the board. You'll normally see this format on more freestyle focus boards where you're looking for pop at the tips, but you still want to retain a more playful and predictable overall feel. Now the final configuration is simply a combination of all or some of the other layouts. You're obviously only gonna find this on high-end boards that are looking for maximum control and response in all areas. Now, before we finish talking about structure layers, it's quickly worth mentioning about a couple of other materials that you're gonna see cropping up when it comes to structural layers. These are Kevlar and flax. Now, contrary to opinion, Kevlar isn't there to increase the strength of the board. It's there to act as a dampener. By integrating Kevlar into the glass structural layers, you get a marked improvement in dampening. This creates a board that is smoother and generally more comfortable to ride over a full day. Now this dampening isn't so relevant for regular boards, but on high-end boards that are stiffer, it can help reduce high-frequency vibrations that come up through the board and can cause foot pain and fatigue. Now flax is another material that we've seen gain a bit more popularity over the past few years. As with basalt, flax is a natural material being extracted from the stem of the linseed plant. Flax fibers are formed on the outside of the stem of the plant, giving them a natural resistance to loading and bending. It's these properties that allow flax to be integrated into the board's structure layers. Flax fibers are usually mixed with the glass cutting down on the environmental impact of regular glass fiber. Now flax also has excellent dampening properties, so we're also seeing it being integrated into the board's top sheet structure. So that structure layer is done. Uh, I know there's a lot of information there, but the reality is it's probably the biggest contributor to the overall performance of the board. So it's been worth going into a little bit more detail. Now in the next video, we're gonna take a look at snowboard bases. We're gonna run through the difference between different types of base material and how those materials perform on snow. So thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next video.